<laughs> Welcome everyone uh, to the October uh, Cactus Poetry Open Mic from Placidas, New Mexico. Uh, we are uh, thankful that you're that you're tuning in, um, live or recorded. And uh, also want to thank the uh, Cactus Brewing in nearby Bernalillo, New Mexico, um, from whom we get the name. Uh, we uh, used to do these uh, at the brewery and we'll uh, come, go back to it uh, in the spring. Uh, we have um, uh, a couple of amazing poets tonight. And uh, the first, uh, first is going to be uh, Eleuterio Santiago Diaz, who happens to be a neighbor of ours here in Placidas. And uh, so we've been getting to know him a bit through that. He's also um, uh, a, um, an associate professor of, um, a, uh, in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of New Mexico, um, and uh, originally from, uh, from Puerto Rico. He is taught widely in uh, various uh, parts of uh, the United States and the Caribbean. And um, his uh, uh, book that came out uh, fairly recently, Breaths from University of New Mexico uh, Press is uh, really worth picking up. It also has uh, remarkable uh, prints by uh, Yoshiko Shimano, so that is uh, something you can order. Jules is putting the book information in the chat if you want to look there. Uh, he also has an, another uh, book coming out from a publisher in San Juan uh, very soon, uh, Arbol de Plaza uh, Tolado, and uh, also has uh, uh, another uh, remarkable collection that I, that I had a chance to read, Colonel, um, as well as uh, uh, a third collection, The Mollusk and the Thumb, and a collection of short stories titled El Circo. Those uh, hopefully will be coming out soon as well. So uh, it's uh, a pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Eleuterio Santiago Diaz, and you may unmute. Thank you. Uh, are you listening to me? Yeah. Okay. First, I want to express my deepest gratitude to the Poetry Playhouse, particularly to, to Jules and, and John for, for this invitation. Um, it's a great honor to, to share my poetry with, with you and, and to share my space with uh, Margaret Randall, who is um, somebody that I start reading when I was uh, at the University of Puerto Rico, and now I have the privilege of sharing space with, with her. Uh, it's not a small thing for me, it's something that, that, um, that I really, really uh, appreciate this opportunity. I'm going to be reading poems, short poems, uh, most of them about nature, my relationship with nature, uh, with um, most of them are short poems from uh, first from Kernel, the collection of poems that uh, I want, I wish uh, I'm going to pub publish uh, soon. And from, uh, if I have enough time for uh, Breath, the book that I published um, in 2012 with UNM Press. Um, and I'm going to make comments along the, the way. Uh, Redwoods. At the earliest hour of dawn, when all is still and every everyone at rest, moving silently through a dense wet fog as he's stepping into sanctity, we enter the dwelling of the giant redwoods. Last night, they came before me in a dream and I heard the word of a bride. Aquí debe estar el Cristo porque están las catedrales. Not even a dream along with the word of a bride could divine the vision unfolding before us. Aquí debe estar el Cristo donde está, porque están las catedrales. It's a verse that I steal from Jose Martí. Jose Martí, uh, the verse means uh, 
Christ must be here because, because the cathedrals are um, this idea of the of nature as a temple, as a temple is um Luis Jose Martí, who is a romantic figure, modernist romantic figure from, from Latin America, but also you know that that idea is also in figures like uh, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Thoreau, uh, John Muir. So I appropriate that kind of idea. Next, um, the desert. This desert is vast, horizontal and empty beyond limits. I am its center and only point of reference. Before myself, even the skyline disappears in a mirage of gold and fire. Dazzle, the soul returned to its intimacy, to its center and refuge. Soon, this abrasive desert will scavenge my flesh and my skull will remain a milestone in the perpetual sand. The Advent. In the deep, echoless valley, the epiphany of an unanswered call, an utmost intimate intimacy, a fresh innocence, true profound void, the mirror does not return the image. Empty footprints ahead, behind, beneath, further below. The advent of no answer, the opacity of the cause. The cause dwells in the mountain. I am a grain of sand. In a different vein, uh, a Restavec legacy. A Restavec, Resta, the word Restavec is a come from uh, Creole Haitian or Haitian Creole. And um, it refers to uh, childs that have been, uh, whose parents send them to live with someone else uh, because they cannot provide for them and with the hope that they are going to have a better life. And most of the time they end up in servitude and abuse. Um, it's even worse when those childs are uh, taken from the street, the, their, their situation is very, uh, very dear. So my mother was a, although we don't use that word in Puerto Rico, uh, my mother was, was a, a rest of it. Um, a rest of it legacy. Eating in public has always been for me the most obscene of human acts. Except perhaps when performed as agape and in a true spirit of common union, eating is also the most mercenary. The display of etiquette does not prevent it. In fact, it makes it worse. I has always disliked my humanity and others the most when eating. I prefer to have my supper in solitude. I inherit this preference from my mother. When I was a child, she would set the table but did not sit with the rest of us. My mother had grown up as an adopted child in a family where she was also the maid. I have never felt fully comfortable with being served by others. That's another reason for disliking restaurants. The exchange of a plate for money reminds me of the commerce of sex. And now that I face the fact that I have lost almost all my molars, I have another reason for avoiding restaurants. There are those who enter the middle class with teeth and those who enter the middle class without teeth. Mother has also lost all her teeth by age 40 when I was still an infant. Too much violence is enacted in the human rituals of eating. This call. This desert is vast, horizontal and empty beyond limits. I am my center and lonely point of reference. Beyond myself, 
even the skyline is lost in a horizon of red land and red land and fire. Silent, the soul remained in the intimacy of his hollow refuge. One day, this abrasive desert scavenged my flesh, and I remain a milestone for wandering growth in the perpetual sand. As you can see, what I did was rewrite the poem, The Desert, as an allegory. The figure of, of, um, the, figure of, of the desert is a symbolic figure. The figure of this call is an allegorical figure. Uh, Joseph Cobb, a most audacious way to defy capitalism is to work less and to consume less. Just empty your cup and sit in Zazen. <laughs> I laugh because everybody understands in the, our society, or many people understand the issue of consumption, but the issue of work is a different story. So don't tell, don't tell anybody, especially at the university that I read this poem here today here for you. <laughs> uh, and then the follow-up, they should go uh, one after another. I, I wrote the title of this poem in two ways, Amble, Amble, and in Spanish, I put a name in between. So it read Amable, kind, no? Amble or Amable. It is not the sun, but the sunrise. It is not the sunrise, but the rose. It is not the rose, bow. it is not the rainbow, but the bow. It is not the bow, but the butterfly. It is not the butterfly, but the flow. It is not the flow, but the river. It is not the river, but the road. It is not the road, but the wind, it is not the wind, but the bamboo, it is not the bamboo, but the bird, it is not the bird, but the sun. It is not the sun, but the rainstorm, it is not the rainstorm, but the flood, it is not the flood, but the advent, it is not the advent, but the dough. And now I'm going to read some poem from from the collection, Breath, the published collection. Um, only a dream. In a lotus pose, one with the flower, only a dream separates me from totality. And the lotus flower does not dream. Waters, the fragile waters in the stalactite hanging from the cobweb on my window is a cipher of all waters. So is the dew that crowns the oregano in my yard. In it, the free spirit breathes the expansive aroma of the universe of the frozen giants. I told a friend of mine, that um, the universe of the frozen giants is the translation of the name of one of the biggest frozen caves in, in the world, it's in New Zealand. And she asked me if I had visited. And I said, no, I saw it in an album that I had when I bought in fourth grade. Um, those kind of albums that we, we buy the chiclets, we get the stamp and then we glue the stamp to the album. She was disappointed and then I laugh and I said, well, if I need to go to New Zealand to soon to know this too, then I'm lost. <laughs> so, uh, stroke two. Um, here the idea is that um, many of what we practice, I'm a practitioner of martial arts, and many of the forms and the partition in the in the martial arts, Japanese martial arts, are encoded in the kanji ideograms. Um, so I wrote a series of poems related to that. To that, this one in particular relate to the fact that in 19, 
97, when I arrived in California, I used to go to the beach to do my training. So the forms, what the, the practicing of the form draw the, the movements in the sand. But then this, the sea, the, the, the sea erased that. And the next day I had to go and do it again. My scripture is a spiral inscribed in Zenku Tsudachi over a million times over the sand and over a million times erased by the sea and its breezes. It's only lucid memory drops under the rock skin of this persistent body. Well, everything that we, in, in this art, everything that we do, do is lost in the moment unless that is recorded. But, um, but the memory of what we do on daily basis stay in, in our bodies. Um, false allegory, Quan Tu. Quan is like a, how can I can describe a Quan? It's like a riddle to be deciphered by the students in the, in the um, Zen and Karate classes. False allegory, Quan Tu. The moon in the poem, the moon in a poem is a figure of illumination. A finger pointing at the moon is an emblem of false enlightenment. If you ever wake up to the truth of cosmos, do not reveal it to me. Just leave me a small signal. Maybe the moon in a poem. Neither mountain nor valley. I wanted to put the flower in your stead and it perfumed my skin. I wanted to put the flame and it heated my temple. I then tried to put the spring and it rippled in my soul. I even tried to put the bell and the badra and my mind clung to the metal. I let go the flower, the flame, the spring and the bell, neither mountain nor valley. First clay. We have arrived at the first clay. Supreme will has buried the memory of the fragmented words. Celestial blue mirrored the eyes of crabs in red procession. A dirty face at the edge of earth doubles the wild flower on the side of the trail. The hermos hymn of an ancient woman from the Mississippi Delta is reborn in the midnight sun of a remote cliff. My early morning breath swings in the sun, the wind and tones in the bamboo cadence. We have arrived at the first clay. Innocence is still warm under my feet. Innocence emerges in miracles as in the primal urge of nature to regenerate as per the razor blade of Huracan. From the deep rift in the soul of a piano, the universe pulses. Listen, now he sings, now he sobs. And I'm going to read one in Spanish to close my, my participation. I think that I'm running out of time, no? Uh, run out of my 20 minutes. Yeah. Let me read this one then. Uh, Noche Buena, Holy Night, no? Noche Buena. La Navidad es la plaza vacía bajo el talante místico de las estrellas. Todo el espesor de la noche transcurre como a la distancia. Se oyen aguinaldos y villancicos. Llegan como traídos por una brisa de otro tiempo, como pulsando acordes vagos con dejos de nostalgia. Nada más puebla el orbe, árbol y estrella. El ángel de Orión es el axioma de la noche santa. Digo árbol y la paz reina en mí plena. Digo estrella y la gracia desciende sobre mí colmando toda mi casa. En el remanso de la plenitud se han suspendido las horas. Se han apagado las músicas disipándose las distancias. 
Todo es intimidad, nada es ajeno. En el árbol reside el universo iniesto. En la noche, todas las noches, en esta plaza, están todas las plazas. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We can unmute if you'd like to applaud. Yeah. Hey. 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 Maestro, congratulations. It's Narla, un abrazo. Hey, Narla. Great to see you. Yeah. Just wanted to read one in, in Spanish. I think that in my, in my conception, the most important thing is to feel the rhythms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they came. They came through very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I was taken by that image of the poems in the sand by the water. Although here, it, it would be the wind that would carry them away, like the winds that we mm -hmm. had today, which were quite, quite remarkable. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I was al also quite taken by the the, the poem. Uh, for your mother as well yeah and i won't tell anyone in your department that you're preaching against productivity <laughs> yeah. publish and perish right yeah anyway well thank you so much uh, quite delightful and i hope um, that you i hope that you get used to my my um puerto ricans the influence of the my puerto rican spanish in my english and not pronouncing the S's. <laughs> Something that is not going to change in my lifetime. <laughs> and we have someone at least from, from Puerto Rico as well. Sylvia is here. Hi, Sylvia. Yeah, so good. Uh, okay, thank you once again. And um, I'm going to introduce uh, our, our, our next uh, feature although it, it is certainly true that she does not need any introduction. Um, and um, uh, we've been, uh, Jules and I have, uh, you know, really been blessed uh, to have um, gotten to know Margaret Randall. Oh, John, you're, you got muted by, hold on. You're good. <laughs> okay, you. thank you. All right, anyway, uh, I was just saying uh, that uh, I think uh, Margaret is, uh, is uh, uh, a, um, a connection for many, many people here in New Mexico as well as worldwide and uh, continues to be just uh, an amazing inspiration um, she is more prolific than almost any poet that I know, and wide-ranging. She writes memoirs, uh, fiction, uh, political essays, uh, and, uh, and other essays, um, like, uh, uh, like this recent book, Thinking About Thinking, which are, she describes as not quite essays. It's almost a new genre. Um, so uh, anyway, it's, um, uh, it's uh, always, uh, always a real treat uh, to see Margaret Reed. Uh, her, uh, just a few of her latest books, uh, the, the memoir, I Never Left Home, Poet, Feminist, Revolutionary, Duke, Duke University Press 2020, uh, the Thinking About Thinking book from 2021 that I just mentioned from Casa Uraca Press. And then Out of Violence into Poetry from Wings Press, uh, also 2021, uh, which are poems 2018 to 2021. So many poems that, that deal with um, this uh, pause, uh, the great pause or our pandemic, um, whatever you wanna call it. And uh, she also has three books coming out in the next few months. Uh, Artist in My Life from New Village Press, Storm Clouds Like Unkempt Promises, which have photographs by Barbara Byers uh, from Casa Uraca Press, and Lupe's Dream and Other Stories from Wings Press. Um, so I could go on and on <laughs> with, with, uh, with, for the next hour plus, 
uh, with, uh, with reading Margaret's bio, but it's much better to hear Margaret Randall speak. Margaret. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, John, for that lovely introduction. Thank you, Jules and John, uh, who do so much for our poetry community through your Poetry Playhouse and Cactus and, and other venues. Um, and thanks to Cactus Brewery. Hopefully we'll soon be able to visit in person. And uh, finally, thank you to Eluterio. I never heard you read before and your poems are certainly powerful. I'm going to read some new work tonight, um, not in any of the books that uh, you've mentioned, but they are in books to come. And I'll start with this poem called Waiting Our Turn. Lawrence, he of Lady Chatterley, said the way to eat a fig was open it until it becomes a glittery, rosy, moist, honeyed four-petal flower. Then, after raping the blossom, hold it in your mouth, lick the crack and devour the flesh in a single bite. Every fruit has its secret, said the poet, women loved, who turned us into luscious fruits to be peeled by hungry lips, then spit out. Neruda, he of communist solidarity, wrote of women's bodies as white hills and white thighs promised to forge us as weapons, arrow to bow, stone in its sling, so he could outlive himself. This poem is my reply, neither seductive fruit to be savored and discarded, nor white in a world of brown and never, ever weaponized. We sharpen our tongues, imagine revenge, and wait our turn. This next one was written on the occasion of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan this past August. It's called House of Battered Hope. Aina's name means mirror. If she looks in one, she sees imprisonment and prison too for her daughter, sleeping innocent in her crib. Gitti means world or universe. Hers has been reduced to her burqa's window of damp mesh. At Kabul University, a professor dismisses his Friday class. I'll see you next week, he tells the men. I guess we won't see each other again, are the sorrowful words he speaks to the women. They all know what's next. The long war that didn't need to be rewards us with a quarter million dead and every human hope betrayed. Fundamentalism bided its time, waited until the occupying force had had enough. On the heels of an invading army's retreat those turbaned men who believe they are God's chosen took every village and city until they arrived at the capital, leaving those who thought they could flee hanging from the wings of departing planes. It's no longer about whether this war should have been fought to begin with, what it cost in lives and treasure or how we count the dead, including only our own or every casualty. No, these are not the right questions and we cannot know the right questions living as we do in another century, remembering the fall of Saigon and pondering the political fallout here at home. 
I am tired of informed analysis against a backdrop drop of open wounds and broken promises. We talk and talk while they are forced to invisibility, made to walk a gauntlet of fear, become a bullseye of regret. The name Amina means safe, but she is not safe. Mother and aunts, sisters and girl children, all have become once more a tired script upon which death's recipe is written. Every Afghan has regressed to a time before illumination when free will belongs to no one, even the men who take control as birthright. Women and girls are left carrying memory to a house of battered hope. So back here on our desert, this one is called the Asekias. The Asekias are dry, dust blowing where water once ran, withered alfalfa, corn stalks bearing sad ears, blighted kernels. The news came first in sweeping predictions, photos of cracked earth and sinking water tables, millions of empty plastic bottles. Then neighbors spoke of dying farms, their losses touching you where intimacy bites your arm with its bony fingers. This morning you turn the handle above your sink and nothing issues from the spigot but the hiss of parched regret. Meanwhile, a multi-billion dollar space program announces the discovery of water on Mars in small but promising quantities. This one is called the sum of one and one. The earth was barren, battered by centuries of greed and salt of abandon. But the poet planted a word and nurtured its hesitant roots, dreamed the rain that would bring it life. That single word grew lonely at times, dependent than the poet's nurturing memories. Once that word stood strong on its windswept home, the poet planted another. She taught them collaboration and that the sum of one and one is always more than two. Time passed and returned with unexpected gifts. A field of words reaches for meaning among the, among the weeds. The words are a poem now, its rhythms piercing a million ears, crowding close so they may hear. And I'm going to end with uh, a very recent poem. This one is, um, a lot of my poetry, uh, recently has to do with aging. I'll be 85 in a few weeks and um, aging for me has been limiting as it, as it always is or often is, but also extraordinarily exciting. And um, I'm very interested in, in, that, um, in that dichotomy between the two situations. This poem is called Humphrey Bogart's Trench Coat. Isadora Duncan's scarf. Unless the unforeseen happens, I'll soon be 85. 85 springs as some cultures tell it. And I wonder if it's ever 85 winters, although the metaphor might cause you to shiver with sudden cold. 
It's all good, as they say, but I admit to surreptitious visits to the New York Times obituaries, where I often find a friend or acquaintance shock piercing the end of a sentence, lying in wait. More than my own mortality, with each loss, I forfeit a bit of myself, temperature of skin on skin, kernel of memory or elasticity of muscle, the sound of a beloved's voice, eyes that hold mine in tight embrace. This is the first time I've written my age in a poem. There was one several years back in which three sentinels harmonized the mantra, but they were lies, stand-ins for moments, marking the rhythm of my years. I can remember when I thought an elder ancient at 60, tottering, dependent, dim about the edges, halting in manner and way, and way beyond beautiful or fit. 60 was unknowable then, the final act. Today I wear these eight and a half decades like Humphrey Bogart's trench coat or Isadora Duncan's scarf before it got caught in the wheel of her motor car. My heart keeps perfect time. If I gaze in the mirror, with one eye closed and squint through the other, the reflection staring back crowds my vision with the innocent gauze of Impressionism's broken palette. I prefer to keep my eyes open, coaxing both sides of the glass to come together, meeting where they speak a language only newborns and poets know. At 85, if you close your eyes, there is always the chance you might lurch to the side, connect with the wrong piece of furniture and fall. It's about answering the moment with resistance, risking the act or gift, deciding there is nothing more eloquent than the thrill of giving yourself to creativity. In a few days, I will contemplate my mirror image and surroundings with eyes wide open, memory dancing in every cell and aiming for 86. Thank you very much. You want another one, Margaret? <laughs> I think there's a the chat. There's a demand for one more poem, Margaret. More. <laughs> more. Otra. Otra. <laughs> okay, let's what see. <laughs> yeah, I think I can do another one. Uh, okay. I'm gonna have to. Um, I'm gonna have to get a manuscript here and see if I can find it. Uh, You know, I think I'll read two short ones. Would that be okay? That's um, correct. Fine. Yeah. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about my parents uh, gone now many years. Um, my father died in 1994. My mother in, I guess it was 2006. So um, I have a poem here. The first one is called Mother. She gave me life, purged me from her body into a world reduced to her parameters, where I struggled against her frustrations, fears, shame. She visits rarely now, only in dreams, or when I sit anxiously, head and hands, seeking that word or image, hiding in broad daylight. I no longer remember her voice, only those gestures that betrayed the demeanor she worked so hard to cultivate 
through years battling what was done to her. I know she loved me. She told me often, although the words sounded brittle against the walls of a compression chamber made of broken glass. It's been 15 years since she left and her image and scent aren't specific, but part of that great storm of before people and places lacking definition in my mouth. Then when I least expect her, she is here beside me, holding out her bony hand, staring with unflinching eyes and the immense courage I never knew she had. And then this one is called My Father's Eyes. As he left, his eyes led the way, receding films, distant and tired, sinking into an armature of dying flesh. My father was kind and gentle, refusing to re-edit his own progenitor's cold disdain. Dad saw good everywhere and sang its chorus, though liberation never embraced him while he lived. As his eyes disappeared into slowing eddies, I imagined them opening wide on another shore, spreading again to contain a pulsing ocean in a place where unquestioning love would finally be his. So those are two from the book that's coming out uh, in the spring from Casa Oraca. Uh, Thank you, Margaret. Thank you for going extra. We always love hearing you read. <laughs> and it's a special joy to hear new work that will be coming out, hopefully in, in uh, 2022. Um, can we all unmute and uh, let's hear it from Margaret. Yeah. Oh. Hey, wonderful. wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop recording here.